Okay, I think we are, uh, I think we are live. Um, looks like we are. Uh, yeah, why not? That looks alright. Um, cool, so yeah, we're a few days out from the, uh, from the Chilcon event that we're painting this miniature for, and it's really not moved on much from when you last saw it, to be honest. Um, the skin's looking okay, it's looking very green, um, which is, is good, it's an orc, it should look green. Um, so I'm going to try and get a bit more light, there we go. Um, so yeah, the goal really is to make as much progress as possible tonight. I think since the last live stream, the skin has come up a little bit, and the the top pieces of leather around the uh, the shoulders and arms have uh, I've continued to kind of work that up through a couple of shades. But I mean, all the all the splint metal pieces still need painting. Um, all the other leather does. Everything around his waist. The sword, the axe, the hair, the skin's not finished. So yeah, a few bits and bobs to, you know, get done. Um, but loads of time, you know, I've got all of this evening and tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it, you know what, it was never going to be about trying to win this thing. It was just about getting something painted in time that I think was is worth taking along. Um, and I still think there's time for that. Um, I won't get to do everything that I wanted to do. Definitely not even going to attempt the uh, the non-metallic metal that we previously discussed. It's not worth it. Um, it's only going to cause issues at this point. So um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll crack on and see how far we can get on this one tonight. There'll probably be a few breaks, but uh, that's all right. Um, if you are joining this evening, please do uh, jump into the chat. It's uh, otherwise a little bit quiet and if not I will just wrap it on um, I'm gonna carry on with the um, with the AK third gen colors for this um, at the moment this is up to a thin layer of light green so I'll continue with light green I'll be taking it up a little bit further to a frog green um, now that's then when this gets a little bit I'm not quite sure I was gonna go up to this kind of bright warm gray from monument hobbies um, but I'm wondering if instead I might swing it more towards a nice yellow and keep that kind of strong yellowiness in the green. Um, kind of just going to see how that how that goes. Um, I'm also thinking I'm going to glaze a little bit of purple down into the kind of deepest recesses just to try and tie things together a little better. Um, purple tends to sit quite well with green, I find, um, just as like a glaze. But we'll we'll figure that out later. Um, for now. Let's get some uh, some light green and some frog green down onto the palette and get started. Yeah. I was chatting to a couple of people the other day who'd seen the um, seen the previous live stream and noticed my little uh, my little pots of uh, sort of very thin down matte medium and slightly less thin down magic mix. Um, I find having them in little plastic shot glasses so much better than dropping medium it sort of straight onto the palette. Um, like up until very recently, like maybe a few weeks ago, I was still just dropping it straight onto the palette. This is a really recent change and my goodness has it ever helped. Um, like the ease with which I find at least that now comes together i'm able to pull things together um it makes a world of difference um i'm actually thinking i might need some different brushes than these uh 8408 that i was using last time uh let me grab some others it's the only thing with that set i know last time i kind of said oh it's a great set but um where it only comes with a honking great size six a size two and a double zero you're kind of missing something in that kind of zero range um, and I find I often don't really want to go as small as a double zero um, but I do want something uh, let's go with a one um, you know I do want something sort of in between there so I think yeah a size one um, series seven is probably about the right kind of thing for what I'm looking for. Um, here, zoom back in. There we go. That looks about right. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, I'm thinking 
with this uh, it's going to be a case of kind of bringing the lightest areas up defining some musculature um, really trying to add some depth at this point not just keep highlighting up um, sort of one of the things that I'm definitely uh, guilty of <laughs> as it were um, is kind of just keeping going on highlights when you can probably stop now that kind of situation um, it doesn't cause a huge problem with a single miniature but when you're trying to paint a lot as we all know um, not knowing when to stop with the highlights can be a real uh, can be a real problem. Uh, so yeah, now with this, I'm just gonna go in with. This is almost just like making sure that the very top layer at this point is wet, because my hope is somewhat that if I work on it while it's wet, I'll be able to blend directly into it and sort of smooth this out. Because at the minute, it's just. It's not at the point where it's a problem, but it is just starting to become a little bit sort of textury, just in a few areas. It's only just visible, um, and kind of not enough to make me want to uh, start removing paint deliberately and um, trying to fix it, but enough that I think, you know, the, the judges will notice it and that's kind of okay, I you know. I think if there was ever any chance of me being a serious competitor, it, uh, it kind of left. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, it's just not going to be a, a situation that's realistic now, but hopefully what I can do is still just take a nice miniature along. Still put something in that I'm proud of and, you know, that I can improve on next time. That's ultimately the most important thing to me, was to kind of prove to myself that having got back into the hobby, I can get something finished. I can get it finished on time, and I can get it finished to a standard that is not embarrassing to put up in front of other people. Um, like, you know, is it really painting competition standard? No, no, it's not. Um, but equally, I'm okay with that. Right, this is, uh, again, ultimately just about a little bit of self-testing, a little bit of improvement. Then my hope is to actually get some feedback from this, um, from a couple of Patreons that I'm, uh, member of um, and that in that sense kind of start to use this to identify things that I can work on moving forwards rather than it just being a did I or did I not place in the competition instead treat it a little bit like hey I painted this with what am I capable of in mind when you look at it what would you look to improve next uh, is is, is a tough question to answer yourself, but when you put it in front of someone else, it kind of gives you a, a fairly objective view of whether the bits that you think are the issue are the issue. Because um, there, there are things about this that I absolutely hate. There are elements of this that if I had more time, I would paint strip. I dislike them that much. Um... Equally, there are elements of this that I think, you know, aren't perfect, but are okay. It could well be that my map for what's okay and what's not is way off the mark. But I won't know until some other folks take a look and provide some feedback. Um, which is also, in fact, why... Ooh, these are quite good fun to live stream in Vernus. Um, to get a little bit of a, a little bit of a sometimes live input, sometimes not live, but still comments, and that's okay, because um, it still gives us, or it still gives me, you know, something to something to work with, some input that is not the norm, some eyes that are not mine. Um, these things are 
I think almost universally underrated, not just in painting, but just like in life in general. Um, like having people who will turn around to you and go, eh, he's not done a very good job there, is super important. Um, but we have to uh, we have to find the right people to do it, and we have to make sure that they know that we're okay with them doing it. Um, we've probably all got people that we would, if we felt comfortable, give feedback to around you know things that they're doing that they could do better, whether it's in our jobs or whether it's uh, just in our lives in general. But you know we often don't because. Well, do they want your feedback? Is your feedback welcome? Do they, do you know what you're talking about? It, are they just going to kick off if you provide such feedback to them? Um, I think it's, you know, it's important that if we want that feedback from people, that we tell them that we want it. Um, so consider this your invite to provide as honest and blunt a feedback as you ever want to. On these videos, on the painting, on my narrative, whatever it might be, um, it's uh, important to me that you know I welcome that. It's why I do these live streams. To me, it's the it's the value that I get from doing them. It's the whole point. Um, yeah. I must admit, I do like this. That, like, I was talking about this colour the other day, frog green. Like, it's, it's a really tricky colour because I could see how you would look at it and go, "Oh my god, that is incredibly bright, incredibly um, sort of yellow for green." Um, I'll pass, thank you. But like, I would totally see that um, in ninety nine percent of scenarios um, and the only reason that this isn't one of them is because it's a crazy fantasy orc with bright, literally bright bright green skin um, but undeniably I'm going perhaps brighter than many others would with this particular miniature um, But I always get a bit disappointed when I see like really gnarly orcs with really dark skin. And I get it, like that's like the Warhammer lore especially kind of talks about how um sort of black orcs are the hardest orcs and da 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 all this kind of thing, and they have darker coloured or darker green skin than normal orcs do, etc. 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 Um But that's fine. But I kind of, I kind of like a, a kind of insanely green orc. If I, if if I'm being honest, like whenever I see a, a sort of darker orc, I just feel a little bit, I don't know, cheated. Like there could have been more green here, you know. Um, it's and I, you know that's a. Definitely a personal taste element, but considering I'm not a professional painter, I'm not entering this competition to seriously try and win. I'm doing it to enjoy it. I don't really mind that it may not be to the, you know, to the taste of the judges or to the taste of the people viewing it. My hope more than anything, if I'm honest, is just to look at it in the cabinet beside everything else and not think oh my god that looks dreadful or it stands out as just being like the worst entry ever or anything like that I think as long as I can look in the cabinet and say yeah do you know what that's what I'm capable of I'm I'm happy you know that that was that was the point that was the goal and I feel like you know are there already elements of this that I would do differently were I doing them again? Absolutely. Um, like realistically, since getting back into the hobby, I mean, how many full miniatures have I actually done? And that's kind of the point: is that it will be the first 
miniature I've actually completed in a little while now actually because I've kind of been flitting between projects not being able to not really being able to stick with them to completion which is a a common problem I think among miniature painters but not really one that I want to encourage um, into my process any more than is absolutely necessary because it is problematic to say the least to not be able to finish your uh, you know to not be able to finish your projects um, tell you what one thing I've consistently struggled with on this miniature is its feet like it's just not gone well I'll be honest um, I don't know what it is about this these feet either like they're just a bit odd there will be a brief pause in a moment I think um, here we are. this is the one real advantage actually of painting in such thin layers is if you do have to slightly change something there we go it's not too difficult. That frog groom really does make a big impact when it starts going onto the mini. Um, but yeah, no, I think... Uh, hey there, crun crunchy paints! <laughs> nice to have you uh, with us. Not sure how long you've been there, but this is my uh, my miniature for Chilcon. Which, of course, being at the weekend is, uh, you know, plenty of time to get it finished. Uh, <laughs> considering its current state, uh, there's still an awful lot of undercoat showing for a... Uh, for an entry less than uh, less than 48 hours before a competition, but that's all right. We just got to finish the whole thing, get it on a plinth. Plenty of time. Uh, well, well, nice, nice to nice to have some company. Um, as you've just joined, it's going to say in about another five minutes or so, I am going to have to take a. Uh, take a brief break as I know someone's going to be coming to the door um, but then I'll be back within kind of like 10 minutes um, but uh, but yeah no so the uh, this has been spread over a couple of a uh, couple of streams but uh, yeah but now I'm gonna keep uh, keep mixing up through uh, keep mixing up through uh, this frog frog green yeah frog green I think it is from the AK range and keep uh, keep trying to push this green just a little bit further than I typically have with uh, with orcs in the past I tend to go quite uh, or make the mis I, I think the mistake of going quite pastel with the colors um, too too high up almost towards kind of a whitey green which kind of you know it works but also makes them quite desaturated and I kind of want this to be a bit more like the uh, how is it like that incredible hulky green? There's a paint name that I'd love to see. Incredible hulky green. That's probably a good way to get sued, actually, isn't it? Calling something like that. But uh, ah, it'd be a. It would sell well for the week before Marvel made them get rid of it. Um, I don't know. Oh, I will tell you what. Like the 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 actual miniature itself, Rackham miniatures. When Confrontation died and Rackham produced those horrific, ple flexible, pre-painted, oh, horrific miniatures, the loss of models like this was, I think, terrible. Because they were... This was at a time when I think they, they were on track to compete with GW. Maybe not in terms of money, but in terms of the quality of their, their miniatures. Um... I think the biggest trouble they had really was the fact that their miniatures were all metal miniatures and we were starting to really see other providers push to uh, to plastics. Um, but like, I'm so glad I kept, oh, I would probably say 30, 40 rack of miniatures in boxes and blisters just in a cupboard all these years. Um, and now being able to go back to them is amazing because no one is producing, like, to my mind anyway no one is producing miniatures like this you know like everything has become very 
I don't know, a, a little bit, a little bit stale in some ways. I think everything's very established. Um, this to me is Rackham was the last company to really kind of try and really follow GW's footsteps in terms of creating a world, creating a law, having a very a very distinct style like no one else's miniatures looked like Rackham miniatures Rackham miniatures didn't look like anyone else's and it feels like now the game has shifted slightly at least in my opinion where everything kind of feels a little bit GW-esque like everything is someone's version of something GW has already done there are definitely some exceptions to that without a shadow of a doubt but on the whole, I feel like it's we we lack beautiful miniatures like this. Yeah, like Reaper is a great example of like they're doing metal miniatures. Like I I just don't think they're like their miniatures are fine. Their miniatures are lower cost miniatures, and for D and D, like they're great. And I think that is still their primary their primary use case, isn't it? But um, yeah, no, I don't think. I don't think like Reaper can really claim to be producing miniatures of a of a super high quality. Like they're fine, they're fun to paint, but they're not. Let's face it, they're not going to be. They're not pursuing GW in terms of uh, miniature quality anytime soon. Um, like I know some people like really love metal miniatures. For me, it's actually got less to do with the material and more just the style. And I think, and I could be wrong here, but it feels like as we've moved to plastic, as we've moved to digital sculpting, and this isn't a universal truth because you've got people like Bob Naismith who's producing stunning digital sculpts that can then be produced in metal, plastic, resin, whatever. Um, the models are better, but I feel like they're more formulaic. Um... Like, I don't know whether people do reuse components of a simple copy-paste, but if the temptation's there, I strongly suspect at least some miniatures at some point along the line have had parts borrowed, reused, whatever the correct and technical terminology for it would be. Um, this brush has horrendously split on the end. I'm going to need to uh, sort that out. There we go. But, uh, there we go. The one thing I would say about these uh, these AK paints actually is they thin down wonderfully. Like they just and and yet hold together, which is nice. Like they th beautifully thin, almost painting with glazes, and yet there's so much pigment in them. Sort of a second coat is almost all you need, as opposed to. Uh, Many glazes where it's going to take lots and lots to actually establish a meaningful coat on the top. And that is really starting to get quite bright now, which is nice. There we go. Oh dear. Hordes have some amazing minis. I'll have to check them out. That's, uh... Again, it's... It, I quite like miniatures like that where you don't need to buy, um... You know, it's not about, oh, you're going to buy an army, you're going to buy a regiment, you're going to buy a box set. Um, the, yeah, the Privateer Press Minis, they were, sim well, I suppose they were, they were kind of in their peak, I would say, War Machine miniatures especially, at the same time as Rackham. I feel like that was quite an exciting time. Um, there were a lot of companies then all, you know, producing really nice miniatures. Um, I feel like when they didn't move to plastic, it hurt them quite a lot. Because um, now I don't really hear anyone talking about Privateer Press and War Machine and that much anymore. Like I'm sure no, there's probably still a really kind of a live hobby scene around it. But at the time, it was kind of like, oh, this is going to be the, you know, the 40k killer, as it were. Um, and then, yeah, nothing, <laughs> nothing happened. Uh, which, you know, I, it's not particularly the case that I want something to literally kill off 40k. First of all, I don't think that would be good for anyone. Um, like GW is the biggest player out there. It would just be nice to see a bit more variety, you know. Um, 
Yeah, love that. Yeah, I do. You know, it's the same. I haven't. I haven't really played like a game in well, a long old time. Like I only, I only got back into the hobby kind of last year after pretty much a decade away, and I just find that now the idea of gaming is um, I don't have the time. Like. <laughs> I could I could probably play a game of sixth edition Warhammer Fantasy uh, back from when I first learnt the game, but the idea of learning a whole new rule system now it just kind of yeah that that doesn't sound like a fun way to spend a lot of time and in fairness an awful lot of money um, like I'd rather just buy buy minis buy paints and enjoy colouring in basically for adults but. Uh, Nonetheless, that doesn't, you know, doesn't mean other people can't enjoy it, right? It's, um, like, yeah, I, I must admit, I wish there were more, I wish there were more minis created with that world in mind. Like, there are some, but I tend to find that there's this assumption that if you're just painting for the enjoyment of painting, then you will be some kind of master painter. Um, that, you know, you'll do some incredible job and you'll want a miniature with complex volumes and shapes and blah, blah, blah. It's like, actually, I'm a very mediocre painter. Um, I just enjoy doing it. And so it's... Uh, it, it, there, it doesn't feel like there are many miniatures made with that kind of painting in mind. It feels like it's either you're mass painting an army or you're a you know golden demon uh entry person or entry person that sounds ridiculous you know what i mean uh someone who's going to seriously compete um like i'm entering this in the competition not because i think i stand a chance of getting a place in the awards or anything but just because i thought it would be fun to uh challenge myself to actually get something finished um I'm not sure if it's the same for other people, but I've, I kind of always thought, oh, when I come back to doing this much older, I'll be better at finishing things. If anything, I am worse. Um, there are now other distractions. Life gets in the way far more readily now than it ever did. And I find it almost impossible to finish a miniature, if I'm honest. Um, so I thought I figured the painting competition was a good way. Good way to try and force myself to get some stuff done. Um, but yeah, well that green's gone on quite nicely. I'm going to need to take a uh, ten minute break now, but I will. Uh, I will be back. What are we? We are 25 past, so back online by 35 past or 25 two, as normal people would say. If uh, if you want to join us again, please do. And I will. Uh, I will see you then.
And we're back. <laughs> so let's uh, let's get back on track with this dude. We'll uh, I think we're at the point now where, as subtle as we've been, I'm gonna have to uh, jump up to pure frog green if I'm gonna want to make any difference. Slap a load of medium into that. There we go. That's, it. I think that's been one of the biggest game changers for me since getting back into the hobby is thinning with a kind of medium water mix rather than just with water. It's uh, just the extra control, I think, has uh, been rather rather a game changer for me at least now for the real fun stuff where i try and paint actual detail onto this skin which is going to be incredibly interesting given how uh, green it is basically but we'll see how it goes this is going to be a bit of a smoothing and detailing pass i suppose Now the idea of uh, just picking out the very edges has always been a bit of a a bit of an equal parts gamble with me. Like highlighting's not really my bag. <laughs> it's uh, one part highlight, one part kind of. Yeah, there's some paint there, and it's certainly lighter than the rest, and, you know, you can probably tell that that's where the light's coming from at the end of the day. Uh, there we are, that's actually gone a bit too high, but I think we can balance it out. Yeah, there we go. I think we'll just say, yes, there's more light on this side of him. Of course there is. Entirely on purpose, obviously, it was not just a bit of an accident there that's led to this side having a heavier light source. No, I always intended for it to be thus. And anyone who says otherwise, no. As this, uh, there you go, this live stream can stand as testament to the absolutely deliberate decision made there to have a much heavier light source on one side than the other. Done for purely artistical reasons and absolutely not for practical expedience, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Come on, there we go. Right. We just did a little bit of that along the tops. It's got to be said that the. Uh, I can see why maybe no one today is making these miniatures. I think they're so stylized, you know, like it's not as if you could use these in something else. It's very recognizably a Rackham miniature from Confrontation. It's got that kind of 90s fantasy look to it. It's not going to get mistaken for a... Uh, you know, you're not going to be able to proxy it in for something in an army, or if you're playing Warhammer, it's not going to look right in a in a space like that. Um, which seems to be more and more of a consideration. Like proxying seems to be, seems to have become, I don't know, like a weird industry in of itself. I wonder if that's maybe why I kind of look around and see a lot of similar-ish miniatures because people are wanting to do similar-ish things with them, you know? Uh, let's try and get a bit in the back there, but not as much. Yeah, a bit there, a bit there. I think, actually, in terms of the green and yellows, 
That might be as high as I need to go because I'm just looking at this and thinking if I do go further, there is a real danger that just everything is going to get blown out. Whereas now, if I drop in a little bit of ice yellow to that green, it will just desaturate it a little bit, but hopefully give me something that I can use with a slightly smaller brush just to put in some kind of highlights-ish. Just some edges, some stretch in the skin, a little bit of a sign that there's some musculature in there that maybe is tensed rather than just big green okayness. Um, but yeah, I certainly think the addition of that, that frog greens really elevated that, I think. Um, just, it's such a yellowy green, it's so powerful. I feel like that has swung it from kind of like a, a I don't know, like an excessively, um, like flat but bright green, round to something that, you know, just looks a little bit, you know, a little bit viable as an actual skin, maybe. I mean, you know, if bright greeny yellow skin was viable, um, which of course it totally is, if you're the Hulk or an Orc. Um, so let's, uh, let's get some of that on the palette. Well, this will be the first time trying to mix this in, this particular, uh, uh, mix. See how Frog Green reacts to that. Oh, quite powerfully. Okay. So this might not work, but hey, it's only paint, so let's find out together, eh? Let's start somewhere sensible and out of the way, like uh, the face. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's where it's going at the end, so I may as well just go in and see what I'm doing. Um... And really, all I want to do with this is just pick out those most extreme lines. And actually, this is just... I'm going to take some of that off. It's way too thin. Um, this is kind of... My, uh, my go-to style does tend to be to ridiculously over-thin um, paint to the point where it's actually little bit problematic to try and paint with. Um, there we are. Especially when, like with this, all I really need is a tiny, in fact not even a full, like half a drop of water almost, just to smooth them out when I'm going in with highlights like this. Meanwhile, there's me chucking medium and all sorts in there. I'm wondering why I can't paint a straight line for eye like. Right, let's try again, shall we? Go in there. That's better. It's funny, I spend so much time making sure I thin the like thin paints enough. Thin paints enough. It's always ha is it thin enough? It's super easy to forget that actually you can totally over thin a paint you can you can push it too far to the point where actually it starts to kind of fall apart in many ways it starts to you know just not quite not quite be doing what you want it to do that might even just be a little too thick now actually let me just drop a tad more water in there it's always well, you know, it's always just like a balance, isn't it, between I don't want actual brush strokes left in the paint because it's so thick, but I do want it to go where I want it to go. Okay. And it's funny actually, like when I learnt to paint when I was in the hobby last time, I was really, really lucky. Like I was surrounded by great painters in my local hobby store which was a games workshop um the staff there were super helpful because back then it was kind of oh this is your local hobby center it's not just a retail uh point uh we are here to help you with your hobby 
um that was kind of the like it was a sales thing of course it was but it worked really well um set a lot of people off into a lifetime of hobby and uh left people feeling very very positively about the place um whereas now obviously more of these stores are just exactly that they are they are stores but anyway the point of that was actually that back then there was a lot of kind of teaching of brush control of the importance of uh you know of the importance of thinking about what was going where in your miniature and why it was going there and all these kinds of things and I don't want to say that that's gone but when I was looking for when I was looking for tutorials online I could find a lot of things that were like very kind of hyper specific like how to paint this miniature in this style but not so much kind of around just how to paint well and that kind of bugged me if I'm honest um, sorry I've just messed this bit up so I just need to apply some of my previous mix to cover that up and blend it in just say it's a little bit of extra a little bit of extra highlight that and I might just just Drop a little bit of medium in. This is uh, this is why I always struggle with highlighting skin. Like the face is okay. You've got edges. You've got lines. You've got natural places our highlights would exist. These other areas now, it's like I end up with these big jumps in value, which is fine in and of itself. But I've kind of got to blend them in a little more. Otherwise, they sort of jump off the miniature a little bit, and that's not really how it works, you know. Um, like you can have the occasional little line that does work every now and then but not that much um, like here it's a great example of that like I am in effect just highlighting a flat rounded surface uh, with a line and that never is gonna look quite right but my hope is that it looks right enough I guess so I'm wondering if actually to help I'm wondering if it would be worth kind of taking it down a notch with a glaze over the top to make it a bit greener again but then am I just gonna go back to having something that's a little bit lacking in contrast you know the whole point of these highlights is to really ramp up the contrast on this and I worry that a glaze is just going to knock it back down to the point where I have to re-highlight it again, which defeats the whole blooming object. Um, anyway, I'll just put a couple of dots and lines at the tops of these abs down here. Tell you what, when I say Rackham had a... Uh, distinct style they really did like the uh it's that classic kind of muscles on muscles look um that you just don't see in miniatures anymore because i think we kind of we moved to quite a comparatively and i say comparatively because we're talking about orcs um or oh, well orcs and fantasy miniatures and sci-fi miniatures in general we moved to a comparatively kind of don't know almost like quasi realistic look and feel now like when you look at certainly kind of games workshop miniatures and to an extent places like privateer press i suppose 
they've got a bit of an edge of realism to them that I feel like they, you know, Rackham never really embraced. They really went for the, no, 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 this is sort of high fantasy, high, you know, this was Conan and all that kind of uh, lineage of, uh, of uh, you know, of fantasy creatures. This was not, uh, this was not something that was going to be uh, changed into something more realistic over time. I tell you what, I'm definitely going to have to do is glaze in a little bit of green over some of these areas because they're just not not sitting quite right. There we go, that's better. So, I mean, those highlights are quite stark, but I quite like them. I think they're quite. I would be a bit aggressive on the feet, in fairness. Um, but I feel like they show uh, you know, a certain style, as it were. I just really don't know if I should go in with a glaze over them and then bring a little bit of it back up or leave it as it is. If you've got any thoughts, let me know. But I'm thinking I might leave them as they are for now. Come back shortly. And just see how they look again with fresh eyes. Just to see if I have any sudden realizations about how I could uh, how I can make them a lot more positive. Maybe it's um, just line highlighting muscles in general is. Uh, yeah, not something that I would recommend doing. I probably should have. Uh, I probably should have stayed where I was. It was a bit flat, but I feel like it was arguably better than it now is. Ah well, we'll uh, we'll crack on and we will see where we end up. The uh, the leather is kind of the next thing that I'm uncertain about. Um, because thus far, I've just kind of taken it up quite naturally. Um, but not really sure uh, if I want to take it further, but I feel like I'm going to have to. Otherwise, it's kind of, what's the point, right? Um, yeah, I feel like it's just too clean. You know, like, it, it will say that maybe, maybe I just leave that as the style maybe just tidy it up a little bit because I think at the minute that leather is if memory serves oxide brown I believe I took it up to light um, this kind of oxide light brown from Chimera which is a lovely paint um, I think that's the colour it is it's sort of always good when you can't quite remember what colour you used to paint something because it's been like a week and a half, two weeks in between painting sessions for something you were really desperate to finish and were super passionate about. It's like, oh, whoops, never mind. Um, that doesn't look quite right when I put it down on the palette. Yeah, confirmed. That is... Hmm, might be it. What I'm thinking I'm going to do is mix in some of this, um, what is this? Uh, scrofulous brown, there we go. Bit of scrofulous brown, and then go in with my favourite colour for painting leather, which is a birch. Just, um, <coughs> not just as it is, luckily, <laughs> that'd be a rather insane jump, obviously. But, like, mix it in and just try and create a slightly kind of damaged leather tone I guess um, maybe try and introduce some kind of um, I wonder actually rather than scrofulous brown if I added in something like a sandalwood because um, the point is at this stage to try and add in that kind of slightly battered feel to it um, rather than having kind of pristine leather um, kind of want to add that feeling of yeah, do you know what? Actually, this this leather's been around a bit. It's got damaged. It's no longer perfect. Um, 
if it ever was, given that it's being worn and therefore one would assume been made by uh, an orc in some kind of warlord-esque environment. Um, if you were on a previous stream, you'll probably remember I had a real problem with my uh, with my pot of birch paint just kind of exploding. Um, and it seems to be wanting to do the same thing again today. So let's see if we can figure out what its issue is. Because I really don't want to lose any more of this colour. Because it's a really, not only is it a really good colour, like scale 75 paint isn't the cheapest either. So there we go. That kind of worked. Sure, clean off that uh, sculpting tool later on. Um, let's see if we can't get a bit, a bit of a mix going here. Then, a bit of medium brown. And that probably is the colour we were at. Actually, I think it's just it dries quite a lot lighter than it did than it actually is. There we go, that's probably the general direction of travel. There we are. That now gives us a pretty good kind of palette for scratching. This feels very unnatural. Um, just kind of draw some random lines all over your miniature that you've just spent time trying to paint very accurately. It feels, it's that classic kind of you have to trust the approach, but um, I'm not very good at that. Like, I'm really, in fact, I would go so far as to say I'm really bad at that. Like, I'm not a. Uh, I'm not a trust the process person, I'm a question the process person. Why on earth would I risk that, having just painted this miniature for goodness knows how many hours at this point. Um, but, I equally, I do kind of get the feeling that without it, especially on a model like an orc, it's going to be the kind of, really, that leather looks astoundingly good considering the uh, you know well-renowned care and attention that orcs pay to their equipment and etc 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 um, like whether or not that stuff really factors in in a painting competition I don't know but it would bother me like, I think that's the that's the bar I'm gonna have to set is what would what would bother me about this miniature if I didn't do it? Because I'm not going to get to do everything, right? Not with the time that I've now got left. But, uh, yeah, I feel like as long as there's a kind of clear narrative to the miniature, at least then it's, you know, from my perspective, it'll make sense. Um, like, orc, orc leather should be damaged. To me, that's just, that just makes sense. Saying that to me, it's kind of like anything an orc owns should probably be covered in damage. Uh, 
they're not exactly known for their careful repair of items or even care of them in the first place. But my hope is that this may be... I suppose it's just kind of important not to literally paint repetitive X's over everything. But already, actually, i got to be honest, that now looks like well damaged, but not not messy, which was my actual concern, was that it was just going to look like I'd accidentally <laughs> drawn lines over everything. Now for the slightly more tricky version of that with the lighter colour, where I think I do need to keep my brush strokes really quite thin, and I guess a lot of the time kind of aligned-ish with the ones I just did. Oh god, that's way too thick. There we go. Go. Sorry, this isn't very interesting to listen to in silence, is it? Um, but yeah, no, it's, um, th this seems to be much more uh, just generally prevalent. I've got to say, actually, in painting compared to uh, compared to where it was at when I stopped painting miniatures for a while, like kind of weathering and battle damage and all this kind of thing seems to be much more now the, the the norm than it used to be i guess like you used you know people used to do it of course they did but it was always more of a i don't know you see it a lot more in the scale modeling hobby than you would maybe in the uh than you would maybe in the wargaming and fantasy miniatures especially you wouldn't see at least I didn't see huge amounts of it, whereas now it seems that that almost one place you did see it, I guess, a lot in sci-fi stuff. At least I did was in um, Forge World stuff, like when they first released the Elysians and the Death Core miniatures. They were some of the they're some of the earliest miniatures I remember kind of seeing battle damage that looked that looked like the kind of thing people painted when they painted like World War One diorama things and all, all that kind of um, scale modeling kind of ethos around accuracy and you know I remember reading a master class a forge world master class book that was talking about like considering what caused the damage that you're trying to paint and using that as a guide for how you paint it and the way in which you weather stuff and the kind of thing that I sort of thought you're right but I've never heard anyone in the anyone outside of the scale miniature uh, world talking in that way um, go I actually quite like that I think that's come out well it now kind of has a feel of being very very beat up rather than being perfectly smooth and I'm thinking now let's just take a bit more birch mix it in go for a ridiculous light highlight uh, but kind of just with the view to Sketch just a few in. It's funny actually, I found that with the uh, let 
moving between those first two. I actually did more in the second. Oh, no, that's way too much. I did more using the second colour than I did with the first. Um, I think now, as long as I keep these scratches relatively short and kind of, I guess, curtailed is the the right word for them just to pick out a few key pieces of damage that maybe look like they would have done more to the leather in the long term this is almost more like the the bits that aren't going to polish out as it were um, so I guess it's important they don't follow the don't follow the natural shape of the 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 orc because it's more about kind of where has this orc been been hit over the years as opposed to where the where the leather naturally wants to go a classic example of one of those times where actually I have no idea if I'm making a complete mess of something or if it's working really well and I don't think I'm gonna know maybe until I look at it tomorrow or maybe until someone else looks at it and kind of goes oh yeah I can see what you did there like that it might be one of those ones where it takes that for me to think yeah that worked um, I'm hoping not, and that when I look at this again in a bit, I'll be like, yeah, do you know what, that was the right choice, but... I mean, weathering it was was certainly the right choice. Like, I couldn't leave it pristine, I don't think. I think that would just have looked really odd. Um, you know, behold my orc in his perfectly, uh, perfectly maintained leather armor it doesn't quite ring as well thought through and sensible does it but again for all i know that plays absolutely no role and all this effort <laughs> to weather up this leather is actually for nothing um if so that's fine it was still fun to do and actually I much prefer it now. Um, and I think, oh yeah, even on the camera actually, where it wasn't showing up much before, you can kind of see where that's uh, where those scratches have landed, and I rather like those. I think they add quite a lot. I'm almost tempted now. Just going to grab a little bit of little bit of birch just mix it in with the smallest amount to give it that warmth that the brown gives and i'm just gonna touch some extreme edges there's always the problem when painting with brush this small and with relatively undiluted paint right is it dries incredibly quickly even on the brush um, but I think overall yes that works I'm now going to call that top half bit of leather done. I think I'm also going to call the flesh done because otherwise I'm never going to get this finished. Which leaves me teeth, beard, hair, metal and the strap running through the middle to do in the top half of the miniature. Um, which in fairness is still quite a lot but doable i think is the is the key thing um very doable so 
I'm going to start with some black because that's going to go on for the hair. Like before, I'm going to stick to using the uh, the Chimera black. Covers well, gives a really nice matte finish. Um, although actually, is that is that the right thing to use yet? Yeah, do you know what? I'm just going to stick with it. It's fine. It will. Ooh, no, I take it back. We're not going to use that. That isn't fine. It's a really bad idea. Uh, I say that purely because there is a well there's a literally 100 percent chance that um i really need to end up with a bit of a satin finish in hair otherwise it's going to look a little bit odd which means i'm going to reach for some ak paints i hope or think uh, that's white rubber black Grey, German grey, ash grey. Oh, it's the only th with all the AK ones, they don't half uh, give you a lot of choice, shall we say? When you've got kind of one, two, three, three whites, then many, many tones. Uh, is no rubber black can't be the only. Although actually. Rubber black might actually work quite well for this because it's actually more of a grey. My hope is to basically give this all kind of black hair and sideburns and all this kind of thing, but have it with some streaks of grey. So I wonder actually, rather than going for like a jet black kind of just for men black walk, because I don't, I don't think they dye their hair on the whole. Um, my hope is that this will give me enough grey in the mix that I can kind of just put a drop of white in there and that'll be sufficient. Uh, this is getting a little bit dry so I'm just gonna pop some water into the wet palette. There we go. A little bit of medium. Do -do -do. Lovely things. I hope the, again these AK paints thin so nicely. You can really stretch them. Uh, right, that should be all right. The only danger now, of course, is really got to try and not get this on the green, which I will almost certainly end up doing. Though hopefully if I do it will be on some of the main body green and not right on a freaking highlight. Uh, let's put that to there. Get that still visible. Excellent. So I'm still uh, the painting on camera is fine for recording, um, but painting on stream I still actually find really difficult. Um, I guess partially because I'm talking at the same time, I tend to forget what I'm doing, and then, uh, of course, I end up uh, just moving the miniature completely out of frame, which is not very helpful from a you know from a you watching perspective. Uh, it must be said. I still got the occasional uh, check in place just to make sure it's still there in in frame. On that note, do shout if it's ever not, or the focus goes funny or anything. It's uh, I try and keep an eye on it this side, but it's uh, easier said than done when you're also trying, for instance, not to paint the green black. So it's uh, it's helpful sometimes just to get shouted at, you know. But uh, there we go, first bit of black on the green. Though to be honest, you might just get away with it because it's right on the hairline. We'll have to see how we do. Appreciate that's not a great attitude around a painting competition, but as I say, it's about doing it and getting something into the painting competition, not about trying to win it this time. That maybe becomes a goal for next year. Although even then, I'm not particularly keen on the idea of painting something just for the purposes of trying to win 
Like it's one thing to kind of have a bit of a a hobby first objective, if that makes sense about it. Like testing where I'm up to, all that kind of thing. I don't think I'm necessarily gonna try then to go, okay, how do I win next time? More just a case of, okay, so compared to a bunch of other people who enter this particular painting competition, am I bottom half? Am I top half? Am I... I don't think I'll be top half, let's be honest. Um, but, you know, get a, get a bit of a benchmark for where I'm at. Okay, so that actually went a lot better than I thought thought it was going to in terms of getting the hair blacked out um actually I think that makes quite an immediate difference as well like it starts to it, it gives a fair bit of shape having that painted i think um it, it kind of prevents it all just being a bit of a mass and a mess um which makes me kind of want to move on to the rest of the face in a way um, I think we're just going to have to wait and see how that, how that progresses. But yeah, I think having that done gives the, uh, gives the face a bit of a shape, which it needed, like really needed. Um, I think what I might do is just try and use a little bit of birch here into that, uh, into that German grey and just use that to, uh, to create a little bit of a highlight and just come in and just touch the higher points don't want to do much don't want to paint the whole beard grey just really want to create a little bit of you know, something a bit different, something that isn't just, oh, it's black. Um, is it's, and there is always a danger, especially in competition, that painting something black can leave it to look simply unfinished, as opposed to black. Um, I think a lot of that is to do with kind of how far are you going in terms of highlights and all all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but certainly I've, I remember years ago when I did paint for a painting competition, I think possibly, no, it wouldn't be the last time I painted for a painting competition, but, you know, it wouldn't have been a million miles off either. Um, some of the feedback that I got was these elements look unfinished um they weren't but what i had done was just kind of painted them black and assumed therefore that they were fine just being black because i intended them to be black and actually i think i stand by black was the right color choice but it was a prime example of you can make all the right color choices but painting something black for example, doesn't re absolve you of the need to highlight the freaking thing. Um, let's uh, let's see if we can drop a few more little lines in there. And this is where my uh, these days lack of brush control really starts to bite because just landing it in the right place is rather tricky when you can't control the brush properly. There we go. Nice big dollop of grey on there. Let's try and brush that off. There we go. Couple of lines. A few more. That's depressing. I have just found a mould line that I did not remove. Well, that's now just going to have to be blended into the beard. Uh, there is absolutely no chance that I'm taking a file to that and trying to remove a mould line at this point of the day. Uh, that's just not going to happen. That's uh, <laughs> That somehow feels like the quintessential hobbyist's moment right there. 
It's like, ah, great, I've, uh, I'm approaching completion of this section of the miniature, and, oh, look, a mold line I completely missed. Um, that's, that feels like a big jump, but I don't think it's as big as it looks, so I'm going to go with that. I think we're now approaching the point where I'm not going to want to highlight the whole beard anymore. I think this will be the last bit that goes over everything. And then the next and probably final highlight, which is going to be heading up towards very near pure white in fairness, will end up being... Uh, just a few little touches because I want the whole point is that I kind of want it to be streaky grey if that makes sense um, like for this min not for this miniature for this painting competition I'd originally wanted to uh, paint up a very different miniature I must admit um, like this was not miniature choice number one. It's a gr it's a great mini. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love it. Um, but I have some beautiful larger scale miniatures from um, Hera Miniatures, which are uh, I think quite a small provider in I want to say Spain. Um, I got on stop for a second before I continue taking that up any further but um they produce stuff like ah, there's one of them there we go zoom out Zoop. they produce stuff like this so this is literally like an armored skull gorget just hovering above the top of the armor here lovely lovely miniature they produce things like don't think these have no these don't have... I've got three of them though um, and they cut they come with plinths they're all kind of 50 52 54 I can't remember and 74 or 76 I can't remember again uh, scale minis and they are beautiful um, like really really stunning um, so I really want to do some of those but um, as time got closer it just became more and more ambitious to paint something of that scale uh, in the available time and so I kind of uh, this was kind of my I love this miniature I think it's really cool let's do this as a kind of um, best of what's possible in the time options um, because there comes a point right where finishing is actually more important than than, than perfection even for a painting competition like there's no point in going ah yes here is my perfectly painted half a model um like that is arguably i don't know i i would almost feel like i was somewhat being disrespectful entering a half painted miniature or an unfinished miniature um like i obviously wouldn't intend it in that way but I, I i i would struggle to sort of feel okay submitting something that in my mind wasn't finished like with this like if he if in my if in my mind this model's not finished in time for chilcon it won't be it won't be getting entered um it's as it's as simple as that i would i would rather not enter than enter something that i don't consider to be complete because i know there are like ultimately i'm entering this thing as a as a bit of fun to see where i'm at to you know just start getting into the habit of painting again more regularly i know there will be other people who have probably worked very very hard on their entry um and it kind of feels rude to them be like oh yeah i just threw this together and it's half finished but whatever uh but that doesn't feel that doesn't feel reasonable or polite or uh, like you want to be part of a community that just feels like you're <laughs> you just can't be asked um, right I'm gonna call that good I may go in and do some little spots of white in that hair later but if I do I'll just use like an off-white um, 
one thing I've got to say AK is really great for is like if you look at the whites you've got an intense white like that high pigment one you've got an off white you've got a white gray which is flipping near white if ever I've seen white you've got an ivory which is almost white you've got a greenish white literally called greenish white you got a I think the next one is bluish white um, which is kind of the same sort of highly oh no sorry a silver gray which again looks very much like white to me um, then we're kind of going to like a rock gray which is only slightly off white like it's you get a real variety of every color with this uh, with the with the AK third gen box set um, like, don't get me wrong, you absolutely don't need a freaking box set of paints, right? That's It's a ridiculous purchase. But I stand by it being worth doing when I got back into the hobby, purely because having a full set allows me to sort of mix consistently, get a nice finish, all, all this stuff, and just get used to painting again without having to worry about whose paint should I buy for this colour and what colour naming and what mixes and what doesn't and all that kind of crap. Um, it's quite nice just to have something that works out the bottle, right? Um, I think the next plan... I kind of just want to... Sounds silly, I want to get the top of his head finished. Um, which means I'm going to need the... I think it's Chimera, Alizarin... There we go, Alizarin Crimson. Another freaking lovely paint. It's what the um, the red is on the sash down here. It's a really deep, lovely red. My plan is actually then to highlight it up with um, the red, which is like the most ridiculously vibrant red. Um, but it's super vibrant without... Because um, it's like single pigment. Um, it doesn't go pink when you highlight up with it. Like if you add like a nice orange to it, it stays really red for like a surprising length of time. Unlike uh, the Chimera colours, like a pink skin is pink. Uh, but there's a red somewhere. Salmon skin, they kind of all... Ah, there we go, there it is. Uh, Cartissa red? Um, it's the one they use for painting the Samurai armour and the Signature Blend set. Like, I really like the Signature Blends paints from them. Um, I think they're a nice expansion to it. But that, just remembering that like they're not single pigment, like the core sets were um it's super important like i've forgotten a couple of times painted something and then had to you know really work hard to make it work but purely because it's not a single pigment and so it doesn't mix as well it's not as reliable especially when you are mixing it with like for instance mixing it with the red or the alizarin crimson where they are just that colour, there's nothing else in the mix, they do exactly what you expect. Um, and then those blended ones just don't, they're more like other miniature paints again, where, you know, more or less you get what you're expecting most of the time, but then occasionally you'll, you know, you'll it'll just blow out because the, the white pigment that's in there for additional coverage is reacting strangely with something, or, you know, all, all the stuff that you that you get with normal miniature paints that you certainly again with the original set the whole point of the chimeras for me was to get that reliable reliable mixing which i get kind of flies in the face of that whole buying the ak set but eh whatever i don't have to have a reason to buy more paint <laughs> Or if I do, I'll just invent a reason. It's fine. There we go. The only thing I do find with the Chimeras is that the coverage is often, I for me, disappointing. For single pigment, sort of artist-grade paint, I'm often in a position where I think ah, that should cover better. Now, the fact that other people don't have that issue means I could well be the problem there. Uh, either 
you know, I might be over or under thinning. I might just be having unreasonable expectation. And other people say they're having a great time, but actually they're getting exactly the same as me and they're just happy with it. I don't know. Um, but either way, I mean, like, two coats there and that alizarin crimson's gone over and got a nice flat base coat over white, splodgy green, bits of black. Um, and I re again, I really like that alizarin crimson largely just because it doesn't, like, it's a really rich red colour. But it's so dark without having a ton of... Well, it doesn't have any black in it. Obviously, it just has the crimson pigment. Um, but it's a, it's a you know, really dark, rich reds. Uh, aren't always great paints. Like, I think back to... Oh, scab red, I want to... Yes, scab red. It was my favourite colour in the GW range. Um by quite some distance in terms of its actual colour. Unfortunately, at least in my experience, it was an absolute pain in the arse to use for anything. Because you you would you would need to put down Scorch Brown and work up to it. Probably with still with a few coats. Um, or like mix up through Scorch Brown using it and it was just painful, man. Like, really painful. Um, to the point where, in the end, I just stopped using it. Like, I just wouldn't bother anymore. Um, especially once the first generation of foundation paints came out. That was, for me, that was it. Um, I was never going to be faffing around with six six colours to get a solid base coat again. No, it was going to be straight in with um, I can't even remember what the uh, what the base red was but it was uh, like it was a horrible red. Like really not great, not a great colour. Um, quite desaturated. No richness to it at all. You would need to do a lot of work after you got that foundation down uh, to get it to a good place. But it was better than literally the other option, which was nothing. Well, which was six or seven coats up from. That's probably an exaggeration. It probably wasn't six or seven coats, but a lot of coats up from uh, from Scorch Brown, and a lot of pain, and a lot of making really sure you would thin your paint well because you were going to be adding enough layers that if you hadn't, um, you were going to add some serious texture to your mini, right? But um, one thing I'm kind of stuff to really create like this kind of battered, big rusty axe, but with a kind of keen, sharp edge, maybe. I don't know. Um, I'd love to spend the time to recreate the kind of classic Rackham um, non-metallic metal. But I mean, I can't paint non-metallic metal at the best of times. and I haven't got time to try and learn it for this, unfortunately. Um, so it's going to have to be a, a, a true metallic metal jobby. Um, maybe that's maybe that's a video to come in the future around me learning and repeatedly failing, I'm sure, to uh, to paint non-metallic metal. But it's always fun to watch people fail, right? So uh, <laughs> it'll be entertaining for everyone else, if nothing else. Going in with... Given how small this is, I am just going to go straight in with the red. I'm not going to do like a like a middle highlight. That would seem a little pointless. And yeah, I think it it works. It it achieves the look that I want to achieve, which is actually almost more classic GW than it is classic Rackham. Very red, very vi vibrant. Um, a bit like the old uh, sort of bolter and weapons casings you would see in second and third edition. I always felt that I kind of missed that. Like I, you know, by the time I was seriously into the hobby, things had moved on, and we were kind of heading into a very 
Blanche dominated uh, kind of style for certainly for 40k and fantasy anyway um, you know which which is a lovely art style but for someone who really just wanted to paint freaking bright colors on everything um, you know kind of cut into that a little bit I found quite often it was all oh, make it darker make it darker add a wash make it look grim and like hey that you know that's the setting that's totally cool but at the same time it's like I really want you know my orc to be crazy bright skin almost yellow you can see how that red really pops um, actually it's it, it's so intense and that's it for the highlight I think I'm just gonna add a tiny tiny bit of birch um, and just add like the lightest strokes on this side here not across the whole thing but just there that's all no more otherwise there will absolutely be a problem and in fact what I'm going to do is mix down like a ridiculous glaze of that alizarin crimson just get a tiny little bit of it and just drop it through the center of that just do with a slight redefining of the center there he is jobs are done that's looking all right. There we are. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting shouted at by Twitch, but uh, I'm sure nothing bad's happening. It's telling me to manage my account from my phone. But uh, hey, it's uh, fine, I'm sure. But no. So yeah, I think having the head done actually helps quite a lot. That looks a lot more like a miniature that's on its way to being finished rather than the uh, the panic-stricken mess that it was not so long ago. Um, with that, I think I'm going to move on. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going to move on to this bandolier across the centre. Um, sorry, I'm turning away from the mic and talking. That's unhelpful, isn't it? I'm going to uh, move on to the bandolier around the centre see what we can't get done there and then start looking at the metallics uh, I've got a feeling like the bottom half of the miniature is going to be a tomorrow problem um, so with that I went for the standard scale 75 black leather base anyway um, which should make this really really easy he says now at the start um, so I'm going to need black leather initially because um, there are a couple of touch-ups to do on it I think where I've uh, splodged it with various other paints along the way um, I'm having real problems with my um, with my scale 75 paints actually um, they just seem to be blocking like constantly uh, to the point where I can't do anything about them um, which is a like I don't know if it's a me issue or if it's a them issue or if it's a I don't know weirdness issue um, I think I may have may have made a bit of an error in judgment store I've got one of those kind of MDF racks like the cheap ones online where they just sort of store on their sides and I'm wondering if maybe just as paints they don't respond well to that um, they, you know that might be absolute nonsense and they're absolutely fine with uh, being stored on their side um, you know that's that's possible as well um, I may just again have uh, it may well be a Tom error as opposed to a paint error highly likely um, but let's uh, let's crack on there start with a few touch-ups on that black leather I'm sorry I'd love scale 75 black leather just that the purple hue that sits in it is such a nice addition to a base coat for leather um, 
especially on a miniature like this where I really want to try and have a couple of different levers across the model. Um, like I don't want, like this jerking at the top, fine, that all goes together. Then all these straps are going to go up this way. Then this one at the bottom is using a slightly richer, um, more yellowy brown that I intend to take up to actually be a little bit lighter, but in shadow, if that makes sense, because it's on his bottom half, of course. Um, like, I just really like the idea that nothing on this miniature matches. Nothing's quite... You know, nothing's professionally made. Everything is just... Ah, well, that's available, so that's what we've got, you know? Um, especially for something like an orc, I feel like that is kind of essential in a way. Like, with... I would, if I saw an orc with very kind of uniformed uh, equipment, I would kind of be wondering why and how and, you know, I mean, they're wrong, like different settings have them depicted differently. And I don't believe, if I remember rightly in the Rackham setting, they're not like a, they're not so much barbarians as they are just kind of like nomadic and kind of very war focused and sort of combat driven um which i quite liked because it meant they had a bit more of a culture i always kind of thought that like there is orc and goblin culture of course in in in, in places like the warhammer world but it's all a bit kind of lazy is the wrong word but it, it doesn't it, there's not a lot to it but like basically, they're bad guys. They're quite generic. They like a scrap. Um, really good fun. And as I said in the previous video, like 100% necessary in the Warhammer world. I think it's always overlooked how important they are um, in the in the setting. In the same way that like both in 40k and fantasy, it tells you a lot that they are in both. Um, they're one of the few factions that really is just directly the same across 40k, fantasy, every, every, literally every environment in which orcs turn up in the Warhammer universes, they are orky, like noticeably orky. It's what they do. Um, and I think the reason it's so important is just that they they provide a slightly kind of madcap, high fantasy, lunatic um, kind of faction that is just funny. No matter how you look at it, they're just freaking hilarious. Um, like, obviously, you know, if you want to get into the grittiness of the world, blah, 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 terrifying, but also hilarious. Like, mushrooms, goblins, squigs, all this stuff is just... Like you couldn't ask for a funnier combination in that in that setting, because they managed to be hilarious without destroying the apparent seriousness of the setting. That's hugely important. You look at forty k specifically. You've when you've got opponents like the Necrons and you know. Um, Chaos is a prime example of, like, scary because it represents things that we recognise. You know, things about human nature, that we are our own enemy and all this kind of thing. It's got quite a lot of that sort of stuff to it. And then there are these bright green nutters who just want to kill everything because it's great for a fight, you know? And they, they have these mushrooms that give them powers and they have... Um, gods that may or may not be gods and, you know, are just big orcs in the sky who, again, want to scrap and fight each other and decide which of the two of them is the best and all this stuff. And therefore it manages to be hilarious and not setting-breaking all at the same time. Like, that's huge. And that's why, sorry, like, like saying it's lazy is incorrect. It's not lazy, it's genius. What it does, however, mean is that they kind of lack, uh, you know, 
they lack civilization as such. They they lack the idea that they might peacefully trade in certain circumstances with other races. Like that is just not a that's not a possibility in the Warhammer world. The factions are too clearly drawn, as they should be. That's that's that that's what that setting is. That is a a wargaming setting to its T. Whereas the the confrontation world always felt a bit more like a world where, in the right circumstances, you know, an orc tribe might take up with a human city to. I don't know, fight together for some reason where it helps them both. Um, like, you know, you would you would still not be maybe commonplace, um, but that would almost even make it more interesting. Like, how has it happened and all the story and that kind of, you know. But you could totally, be- it wouldn't break the setting if it happened. If you had Carl Franz and Gringor Ironhide going, yep, best buds, now we're going to go and take on Archeon as actual allies, no, the whole, the, you know, the... The kind of foundational underpinnings of the setting would fall apart. Um, you know, the good guys can't be friends with the bad guys and vice versa. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't know. It's it, it, it's a tricky thing. Like, I'm, I'm quite glad that they're different. Like, it, I guess as much as I... As much as I like and maybe prefer the the Rackham miniature style to what we're now getting from, uh, especially from Games Workshop Orcs, like recent get ga- recent Games Workshop Orcs have been cool, but not to my personal taste. Maybe that's that's the way I would word it. Um, and with this, I'm just trying to cover this in just like just scratches, just constant scratches, um, because to me this this bandolier would be all but falling apart like this i love the idea of the fact that these items are kind of items that are almost never not being worn if that makes sense like they're just forever being knocked about and used for things they probably shouldn't be used for and everything that goes along with being an orc's bandolier um hopefully that's kind of somewhat visible on the camera so that's just covered in scratches and little lines and then i'll just go in with some pure birch again still i I just think it's such an underrated color it's absolutely brilliant um Don't really want it to. It's the only problem with brushes this size, the paint dries on them so quickly. I'm just going to go for a couple of slightly scratchy highlights along the edges Just little scratches all around the areas where it looks like it might get. I think I quite like the idea that just around certain edges it... You know when you just kind of that, oh, something always catches on that part of my jeans or whatever. Kind of trying to recreate that a little bit. Yeah. I'm going to call that good. Yeah. There we are. Like, not perfect, but I don't think at this stage 
anything that I've done there is really going to swing things one way or the other for me. That bandolier looks great now. I like that. Looks suitably damaged. And then we'll just pick out the metal buckle in the middle. That'll kind of act as a little bit of a differentiator, I think. I think this is starting to look reasonable now, actually. I certainly wouldn't be painting an army of orcs in this style, I must admit. It's a lovely idea. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. But uh, it would take far too flipping long. So let's... Uh... Right. I think I might try and get some metallics on there, you know. Um, part of me is like I should really do his teeth. Um, but another part of me is like that feels like a huge amount of work. And I am not really in the mood for a huge amount of work right now. So let's go over to Biddly Biddly Biddly. A nice base coat brown. Now, even when I'm doing true metallic metals, I try and base coat any metals that I'm doing in a suitable kind of um, uh, sort of non metallic colour. So, like for gold, I've been really enjoying Gold 79 from, uh, from Chimera. It's one of their blended colours, so I, you know try not to mix it but it's I find a phenomenal color to then go and paint gold over um, like I always find painting gold to be a little bit of a pain uh, I'm not a huge fan of it as a color generally anyway um, so anything that makes it a little easier a little quicker a little bit more reliable in terms of how it goes down like I'm on board um, like pretty much straight away um, now the coverage on this is not the best but actually it doesn't have to be it is just offering a little bit of kind of a I don't even know how to describe what it does because I wouldn't say it offers a base coat as such I think it's more what it offers in terms of uh be the right wording like the tone that it puts through underneath the gold um, like inherently metallic colors don't really ever color cover color cover there's you know because they're made up of flakes of multiple things mica aluminium etc um, they will there will always be gaps and therefore the color that you have underneath the metal is always somewhat relevant not always massively relevant to be clear and usually you'd be hard pressed to sort of go oh you've put that underneath the metallic but that doesn't make it pointless at least in my view um, like I still find there to be value in in, in, in doing that and I have realized as I'm getting ready to move on there's a whole strap that I have missed uh, on his arm which is a little bit gut-wrenching to see uh, the good news is that it's quite small uh, so I'm hoping that I can pretty quickly fix it uh, it's just here just along here so I'm just going to go back in with this luckily I've still got all the colors on the wet palette that are doing this typical freaking poor eyes from me right next up it's the one advantage of having literally just done this I suppose is the well I know what to do I know what works and maybe what doesn't, I guess. Uh, I think I'm going to strap this thin, to be honest. It's kind of going to be all about the the final highlight when it comes to adding actual scratches because nothing else is really going to show up. It's going to need to be quite stark to uh, actually make any impact on something. Doesn't help that this is also quite dry paint at this point. There we are. I'm going with the birch. 
just try and pick out some little edges and some little cracks in the leather maybe there we go that's that Probably a little bit heavier than I ought to have gone there, but I think overall that's fine. And then just come over it with that gold again to give me the little buckle. I know I've also got gold up and around here somewhere. There's an earring. I saw it earlier. I know it's here. Right, so one mistake I have made there. But I think with a little bit of smoothing out, yeah, that's going to be fine. There we go. Jobs are good. A classic example of going after far too small a detail. Should have just left it. If I'd have left it, no one would ever have noticed it, I dare say. But I knew it was there, and apparently that was enough. Uh, I've also just realised there is a small metal buckle here, and a strap that it attaches to that I have not in any way, shape, or form painted. So that's going to be a job for later. With the actual, uh, with the actual metal the silver, I should say. I'm kind of still undecided about what to do here, but I think it's going to be quite a dark... probably steel, I'm thinking? Definitely not silver. Maybe steel or dark aluminium? I think steel's marginally darker. Um, anyway, this metal colour can be really thin. Um, it always makes me very nervous whenever I'm painting with it. And what I might end up doing is just dropping a bit of the rubber black that I was using earlier into the mix. But we shall see. We shall see how we go. Let's drop a bit of that on the palette. Let's get it away from all the other paint first. Yeah, definitely going to drop a little bit of black in there. There we go. The one thing I do find with this stuff is it's incredibly thin, but not actually too bad in terms of how easy it is to control like it you know thin but controllable I can work with it's when you get those kind of paints that are just everything everywhere all of the time just pi pigment flying basically I can't or I say I can't I struggle shall we say to deal with that because it's just chaos I always find at that point like once once you've lost control of a thin paint you've lost control of the miniature really like I always I struggle to pull it back especially metallics like if you lose control of metallics I find you you lose your miniature very quickly because they are a pain to try and cover up I, you know, I tend to always find, like, once I've got metallic pigment on an area of the miniature, getting back to no metallic pigment there is a tall order. I very quickly kind of surrender to the idea that, well, there's going to be some shininess there, or I'm going to have to go in with something 
very opaque that I would not otherwise have painted on that part of the miniature. Which, again, is not really how you want to be making big, bold colour decisions. Um, you know, like if I want to bring in a whatever, a bright or a deep purple or something to the miniature, I want to do it because it's what I want to do, not because it's the only thing I've got that can reliably cover up this metal pigment that's now all over a bit of the miniature that I did not want it on. Um, that's why I'm always a little hesitant when uh, bringing in the metallics. But that's gone onto the axe quite nicely. Like it is a, a little bit of black helps, I think. One with just slowing the pigment up. Um, but, but, you know, actually creating quite a nice solid cover as well. Um, like, you know, this stuff always covers well anyway. Like it doesn't ha it definitely doesn't have a coverage problem. Um, I do, s oh, damn it. I do sometimes find that it has a, as I say, like a, like a liquid problem, like how quickly the, the pigment does run. Um, like if you lose control of it, you've got to be on it quick. Um, and often I, I am not quick enough, uh, if, if, if I'm honest, to, to offset things like that. Uh, and I've just tried to cover up that area with completely the wrong brown, but that's fine. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to go back to a smaller brush for doing these metal bits, though. That was ambitious to do it with a larger brush, uh, considering how much time I've now put into the, the leather I could really do without having to redo any of it if I can avoid it. Like I'm sure I'll end up getting some on there, but if I can minimize it by using a smaller brush then a smaller brush I shall use Q being told it's all about the tip of the brush etc etc you're all absolutely right but what can I say when I need to be accurate I feel just straight up more confident actually using a smaller brush and I feel like a lot of being accurate is actually about feeling confident like if you're hesitant your hand shakes you are going to be less accurate if you feel confident you paint in straighter lines or you paint in more consistent lines anyway like you're not forever painting a little bit and lifting the brush um, and that's a lot easier I always find to control if I can paint a long line then it will be better than if I'm painting a little bit backing off painting a little bit backing off um, like that for me is always a recipe for mess um, for things ending up where I don't want them to end up or pigment running or you know all, all the uh, all the issues you get with uh, all the issues you get with metal for me metallics I know other people you know I know people who love painting metallics. They would they would only paint metallics if they could. Um, you know, I uh, I envy them that uh, that ability. Same as those who have had the time to learn to paint non-metallics. I think that is definitely for next year. I might set that as my goal. But this time next year at Chilcon, I'm or uh, well, hopefully this time next year, I'm already finished. And I'm not painting my miniature quite so last minute. Uh, I'll be somewhat miffed if I make the same mistake two years running. I probably will, and we'll be here next year, and we'll have a good laugh. Um, but uh, no, uh, I think a good goal for next year would be be entering non-metallic metals. on like a nice a nice miniature like I, I wouldn't want to if I'm honest if I was going to paint non-metallic metals I wouldn't want to paint like a knight in full plate armor or something like that feels excessively ambitious it, well you know it's maybe if it's like the right miniature maybe maybe a model like that actually would be quite nice to paint in non-metallic metals it would be worth it as it works it's not the metallics aren't such a small part of the miniature 
Because I think that's a lot of what I worry about with them. Is just like, ugh. For the small amount of metal, oh, I say small amount, massive axe. These splint armor pieces on the top and the shirt and the, the, the pieces on the buckles and that. But really this miniature is about the skin. This miniature is skin, axe, leather. Let's, you know, that, that's really what this miniature is made up of in terms of major components. So for me, the skin was always going to be the priority, no matter what. Um, I, I feel like on a model like this, if I get the if I get the skin right, I get the leather in the right tone. The leather itself doesn't need to be perfect because it's, you know, it's leather. Um, but as long as the, the tone is right, it will support the skin. And that's why for me it was important to get that mix of tones in there. They tell a bit of a, a story. There's a bit of a narrative to the miniature. The axe then is the 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 big. Uh, well, it's the, it's the weapon, isn't it? You know, let's let's be honest. On these fantasy war gamey sci-fi pieces, the the big gun, the big axe, the magical sword, whatever it is, is always going to be part of the part of what makes the miniature and what doesn't people are going to look at it so in this case it's that kind of big chunky axe super sharp but not necessarily sharp because it's looked after really well and more just sharp through regular use maybe um, and therefore I can go to town with some Maybe some streaking grime, some rough streaks, all this kind of stuff on there. And I think that'll add a, that'll add a lot to this when I get to that stage. But I'm hoping that that, you know, elevates the axe beyond... Oh, silver paint. Because I suppose that's that's always the, the challenge, right? If we're painting using metallic paints, how do we still not just paint it, you know? How do we still... in inject a bit of story make it more than more than literally coloring in um for for adults um which i always think is a bit of an unfair criticism like i, I say it myself when i paint toy soldiers or coloring in for adults or painting by numbers because the miniature's already there but when you see you know when you see the work of people like roman lapot it, you're kind of reminded that actually the miniatures are just there as a canvas. Like there can be more there, there can be less there. Um, you you know you can create new detail. You can remove or paint out or physically remove if it bothers you that much. Um, detail you can choose not to paint things, and that is just as much of a an artistic decision as how you paint the bits that you do paint. Um, so if you feel like, you know, you don't want to paint something because it's in the darkest shadow, don't paint it. Leave it, you know, leave it in the darkness of the miniature. I, you know, I love that approach to painting miniatures. Um, like, I would never claim to be a painter of that skill, but certainly I aspire to be a painter of that style. Um... The style that says how what you know what, where do what what do I want to create here? It's not about what does the miniature give me. It's about what do I do with the miniature. Um, and you know that's certainly the uh, the approach I've taken with this dude. It's just one of like hey, you, what what's in there? You know what can I what can I find? What can I get? What can I uh, what's the right word? What can I pull out from the miniature, and what do I want to not bother with from the miniature? Um, so that's the st that's steel on so far. Next up, we're going to go to dark aluminium. Um, you have to excuse the rattling. These are quite uh, quite noisy bottles. I must admit, though, I love the um, uh, the metal color ones. Like, yes, they are one hundred percent designed for airbrushes, but. Um, but I just find that doesn't really matter. Um, like they even say airbrush on them. They brush on so nicely though. And because they're designed for airbrushes, they are just wonderfully thin. Like really wonderfully thin. Um, 
there's nothing worse than having to try and thin i don't think anyway uh, like try and thin metallic paints um like, i really struggle with like what's enough what's too much all, all those kinds of questions um <coughs> pardon me again and then just to be able to uh you know to be able to just say okay yep yeah, gonna do something a bit brighter there gonna do that there not gonna worry a huge amount about what is technically the requirement here and i must admit like what i'm really doing here is just looking at when this is up in the light what does get hit and what doesn't get hit um so i'm doing like top halves of these panels in the lighter silver not that one not that one bit there bit there only actually a little bit across the very top side of that nothing on the bottom then Again, this is kind of a very, uh, I don't know, like fundamentally here, I am not painting this well. I am painting this in a very kind of, uh, I don't even know what the right word would be. I'm painting this like I paint on canvas, which is always a bit dangerous with miniatures, but... I tend to find it's a bit of a kind of like a well when in doubt um, just sketch in where you think stuff should be um, and actually like I've only recently started thinking like that about miniature painting having watched some of the Roman the Pop videos and just kind of noticing that again nowhere near the skill level but I paint more like he does when I watch him paint, the way he moves the brush, the way he looks at it, the way he makes seems to make decisions on videos at least. Um, when I'm painting on canvas, um, like on canvas I find I you know I can be aggressive with color and contrast. Uh, I just get in there with a brush and slap paint on and move it around on the model rather than trying to perfectly place it every time. And I see that in what he's doing, and I sort of think, wow, if I could, if I could just do that on miniatures, that would be amazing. And this, I guess maybe this model and this whole entering this competition is a bit of an experiment of exactly that. It's me painting a model how I would paint on canvas. Um, so as to not, you know, be forever stuck as it were. Um, there it goes. So now I'm going to, I'm jumping straight from dark aluminium to aluminium, which is an incredibly bright silver. Because basically between steel and aluminium, I'm not seeing enough of a jump to be particularly happy with it. So and all I'm doing, like when you see here, is I'm saying, okay, so this part looks like it would be a lot brighter. So I'm just going to slap some paint on it. No attempts to kind of really place it specifically. Edge highlight on that because it's going around the arm. This one, entire top half. This one, kind of top uh, right corner gets a drop of that uh, moving across here uh, you get it across the top and down this side um, but no more than that nothing to the center here just a line there maybe a bit coming down there little bit there nothing on the underside because that would be in shadow Again, this aluminium is such a big jump. It, to me anyway, kind of screams, yes, this looks right kind of thing. The minute you put it on the model, and if it's not right, you immediately know, and you know you have to kind of start thinking about how you're going to cover it up. Yeah, I think that's somewhere around where I would want it to be. A 
again, it's not a not an exact science here, but I do sort of feel like it. What I will probably do now is just go in and smooth some of this stuff out. Again, just recreating that illusion of kind of where is this, where are these shiniest points? do just go a little bit back and forth between these just to create a little bit of because it kind of feels like everything got a bit homogenous there actually I'd prefer some of this to be a little darker there we go I'd like some unevenness even in the actual blade itself, just in those center pieces there, just feel like they should be a bit, just a bit darker. There we go. Almost like we're trying to create some. Uh... There we are. Quite like that. That's getting on for being like quite a pleasant thing to look at. Um, like in terms of a big great dirty axe you know like just do similar on the bottom a bit darker a bit lighter much more of the light there we go now I do have a little bit of a secret weapon planned for that axe which is Dum, da, da, dum. This brilliant white, which is a, an FX Fleur paint from Scale 75. Um, this is a paint that I almost never use. Like, this is a fluorescent paint, um, but it's white fluorescent paint. So, as you can imagine, it's kind of uh, largely pointless, if I'm honest. Um, you don't really get to use white. Well, using fluorescent paints at all is tricky, right? using white fluorescent paint, like how often are you painting fluorescent white? Or wanting something that is white to fluoresce in some way. Um, like it, it always struck me as a weird colour. And then just recently, I watched, and I cannot for the life of me remember whose video it was here on YouTube. Um, I watched a video and they were just like, oh, if you ever want to just add some really kind of unusual looking edge highlights, to a uh, to something that's made of something that you've painted with metallics just go in with a fluorescent white um, and I've never even thought about it but their fluorescence are almost in many ways like pearlescent um, as is this brilliant white and so now, whilst everything there is still just a little bit wet, I'm just going to go in with this white and just tap the edges. Just give it a slight, I hope, zing. Um, like I'm trying not to water this down much, if anything at all because fluorescence again can lose their they can lose whatever it is that makes them a little obviously what makes them special is their fluorescent pigment but like it's not just that it's the just the right proportion of it um that really makes them that makes them a good fluorescent or not because lord knows there are some awful fluorescent paints out there that just don't achieve anything 
Um, and what this is really great for as well is like little scratches, little little nicks onto metal. without having to reach for a metallic paint um, which can be can be real tricky to use in that same way um, and like all I'm doing especially on this underside is just kind of drawing these streaky lines and just trying to keep it relatively light Like lots of them coming from the direction of the axe, like there's pretty serious impact work happening there, but trying not to completely overwhelm everything else that we've just done. Um, but yeah, no, I now think that's pretty that's pretty good. Um, from there. I might just take a little bit more of that fluorescing paint and just put a little bit of it on here, a little bit of it up there, a little bit round there, tiny bit of it here, and there. Like you'd, again, it's not about every bit of metal. But just kind of picking those those little bits that you think, oh, that could just do with ever so slight of a little lift. Little lift there. Doesn't do much else for us, but it does do that very well. There we are. I'm going to call that good. Um, so those are all looking all right and shiny. Um, the axe itself, though now really needs some uh, some love and attention um, so I'm thinking what I might do here is go in with some I'm thinking that, that needs to be darkened down there we go That's better. I'm going to switch away from my nice brushes, get some synthetic brushes, and start going in on the uh, on the axe head here, because I feel like I'm going to want to use a little bit of rust, definitely, and I might do some rust streaks, but I'm not sure. Um, I will almost certainly, however, use some streaking grime. Um, now, with that, currently, that's going to be dry pretty soon, I think. Um, I think I'm going to start with the dirty down and just see how we get on. I like using the dirty down. If I can just use the dirty down, then I will. Um, really, just because it's water-based and therefore a heck of a lot easier to fix if something goes wrong um, but also then I don't have to reach for um, odorless thinner which I think is always preferable um, like if I don't have to use something that you know is an environmental hazard I would rather avoid it sounds like the uh, Vortex Mixer has done its job there. I tell you what, that's another uh, another real find since returning to the hobby for me has been like entirely unnecessary find. I got it's worth you know remembering that it's it is that quintessential I burning money. There is no reason I couldn't just spend an extra few minutes and mix something by hand. Absolutely no reason, um, except for the fact that I'm really lazy, and therefore the fact that I can s I can be really lazy, but now, for instance, still use something like this dirty down is awesome. Uh, 
Um, so my plan really is pretty much to slap this all over this thing. And then take it off again. Um, during that process, what I'm going to do is get that on there. There we go. Look, yeah, slap it on. Lovely. I, things like this, I enjoy using them for their simplicity. Not because, and I know there's this whole thing about, oh, like it's talent in a bottle, you just slap it on and it does its job. Actually, I think there's a lot more to using it well than that. Because um, otherwise, like, buy Dirty Down, slap it on a miniature, job done. Per perfect in every way, apparently. And it's like, well, no, actually, you know, there, there are people who use Dirty Down and their models look amazing. There are people who use Dirty Down and their models look fine. There are people who use Dirty Down and their models look awful. Um, like, I don't know which category I fall into yet. I've not used it enough to find out. But my intention is to kind of find out now. But also, yes, it's subtractive rather than additive. Doesn't inherently make it easier, though. Um, I do think you get a nicer effect using something like Dirty Down rather than painting rust. Um, kind of the, the old way, which is stippling through browns and oranges, like that. That way works fine. You get great results. Um, I know people who paint things way beyond what Dirty Down can do with that, but I suppose this is a little bit of le a leveller in that sense. Um, in that now I can, generally speaking at least, um, get to something that's workable much quicker. Um, but for me, my approach with it is always just coat the whole area, absolutely slap it on, anywhere you might want some rust. And then what I will do is go in with... Oh, no, my light's falling. Come on, there we go. I will go in with um, water on a brush, obviously, and just start removing it and figuring out, you know, loosening bits up, dragging it around, trying to create streaks um, and lines where I think it would gather. Um, but the natural variation that something like this brings, like these, these tide marks that you get with real rust, these, you know, the way it's drying and, and colouring and discolouring and grouping is really important. Like, it's vital if I'm going to get something that looks realistic that we start from a place of kind of way too much and then we remove piece by piece, drag by drag. Um, we can see the longer we let this dry, kind of the... Uh, the stronger and more interesting the effect becomes, but equally I'm now starting to see, okay, so where am I going to want to remove from? Well, obviously, you know, I want the blade to be sharp, so I'm going to need to do a lot of removal around the, brain, the blade. Um, you know, I want the edges of these to probably be quite sharp and, and, and direct, but actually the bodies, the flat areas, would show areas of rust. But I would expect them to look a bit uh, a bit battered, a bit, a bit rusted away. Um, and I'm realising now as I'm talking, I've kind of done the axe a bit kind of like, yeah, let's slap it on. And completely forgotten about, like, for instance, this bit at the bottom of the axe. And this is, this is where there is danger. Like, if you're going to apply it to one bit of metal, you've got to figure out kind of where does it belong on all your other metals. Like, for these, I definitely don't want to use the same approach because well to be entirely honest with you there's too much mess like I don't want I don't want to be subtracting dirty down down onto other bits of the miniature but I do still want them to look like they belong on the same thing so what do I do well in this case, what I'm doing, where all these bits of metal are, yes, they are now all highlighted up. That doesn't inherently mean that they need to stay shiny. Let's get some dirty down on them, and then I can start thinking about what needs to be removed, what doesn't. 
that axe is now really starting to starting to go which is nice and we can we can see which I always enjoy I'll be honest like it's always uh, always a pleasure to see it where the top halves of things just start to rust and the bottom halves are actually pretty okay um, this is this is something I noticed um, kind of about tools. I you know I spent a lot when thinking about how I wanted to do this. I was kind of oh I'll go and have a look at some just some metal like what have I got that's rusted? Oh well, there'll be some tools without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and sure enough, like spanners and where they are in the box, they're upright. <coughs> and sure enough, the what you know at the top of the top of the box. We've got rust effectively like dripping down them as if it were a liquid. And then at the bottom, near perfect metal. Um, so now the plan is, with the same brush, grab the, uh, grab a little pot of water. And this is why I always keep a bunch of these little plastic shot glasses about because I really don't want this stuff like in my paint water um, like flammable highly flammable liquid vapor causes serious eye irritation keep out of reach of children keep away from heat hot surfaces sparks open flames you know don't drink it etc 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 not the sort of stuff you want to accidentally ingest so thus I'm using a, an army painter regiment brush. I don't I don't paint with these with these synthetic brushes. Um, so it's just kind of a brush that serves no purpose other than to do this. And then with some water on it, just go in and kind of work work my way into this. Um, I know I don't want any out on the edges of this blade. So, job number one really is going to be getting the blade clean. Getting the blade back to being a, you know, somewhat effective looking weapon. Taking the edges off. This is just like you know straight up. This is not good for the brushes. Like that, you know, it won't shock anyone. I don't think to learn that you know treating brushes like this will mean they do not last as long. Um, but that's kind of why, like, I, you know, I absolutely wouldn't use like a nice sable brush for moving around your you know your rust effect um that cut that would kind of feel a little crazy um i'm sort of getting on for happy now with how that's how that's sitting then we've got the bottom and we actually need to repeat that whole thing again so i'm going to put some water on the blade edge go all the way down it keep moving keep moving take the edge off that side come over here Start working across the top, get that hard edge there, then really focus in on this this bit here. Um that seems to be, you know, excessively corroded, shall we say. I guess that's largely just down to kind of where it where it naturally fell, I guess. The only thing with this stuff is that I'm, uh, you know, you do not have total control when you use something like this. You are somewhat uh, product reliant, which is always a little bit scary. But I would argue that actually, in the grand scheme of things, it's water based. If it's really bad, just slop a load of water onto it and pull it off the miniature entirely. 
Um, if you want to be safe, you can always go in with a. Uh, oops. If you want to be really safe, you can always go in with like a gloss varnish before you put this stuff on, and then uh, you know that gives you that kind of. I always think gloss varnish is a bit like, uh, kind of like the ultimate version of saving your progress, like having a backup, because um, you, you you know you can buy a strip down to a gloss varnish. Worst, like you know, that's that's pretty, that's pretty severe to be bio stripping your model back, um, just because you're unhappy with a with a rust effect. But I, you know, I, I I get it. Like if you if you're unhappy with the effect, you're unhappy with the effect. Um, and it, you know, if that is the case, then you may you may want to uh, you may want to do something about it that does seem maybe you know insanely extreme to me, but doesn't mean it is just means it's extreme to me like you know i'm a great believer in you know, your miniatures are your miniatures if you want to if you feel that what you need is like a pretty extreme reset go for it is my thing i think as, I think as long as we're being somewhat brave when we go yep do you know what i am going to do this then it's probably the right decision. It's when we're being perhaps a little bit less brave with our decisions, or certainly with my decisions, that I later come to realise I was making the wrong decision, and that's why some part of me was so hesitant to commit to it. Um, and like, I can see, you see this now. Like this isn't this isn't perfect. Like this is not quite how I imagined it going but at the same time like, I can't complain too much like this is not like it's not quite what I had planned but at the same time you know kind of oh well maybe maybe this is better who know who, who knows maybe maybe the unusual combination will win me some points and hey if it doesn't like I said it's not actually what the point of this is. Um, I do need to uh, just sort out that bottom bit though, because that's been left on a tad too heavily, I think. There we go. I must admit, I really, uh, I really do like this stuff. I think it creates such a nice effect. Um, I'm now kind of just debating how much do I really go in and remove from some of these like they are I think actually I'll end up removing quite a lot but that's okay I think what will remain will be better for having been added on in bulk and then removed rather than rather than being put on extremely carefully and precisely like this certainly wasn't that as you've seen like this was not put on with great care at all this was put on with quite the opposite um you know the one thing i love about this stuff is how wonderfully rich the colors of it become when you introduce the water um like i would go so far as to say that using it without removing some is kind of mad because the magic is in when you remove some you get water into it and these wonderful oranges just leap out now we're not going to really know what the full effect of that is until it's dry um, like that is one I would say significant downside of it is time. You've, you've got to wait for it to dry. Um, and I have found going at it with a hairdryer is counterproductive. Like pretty significantly counterproductive. Um, like it does not, doesn't respond well, doesn't dry well, doesn't, you know. You just end up having a bad time. But... And this is something I wasn't fully expecting. I think in terms of colour palette, that now looks really nice. 
Like once I bring that up, I'm going to go back in. I might try and I might try and sort of stipple and sponge in metallics tomorrow for that kind of broken over the rust look. That to me now looks so much more cohesive than it did at the start of this session. Um, what's more, we've got loads of the leather done, the skin's done, the hair's done, the top knot's done. Um, it's now really the bottom of the miniature and a few little bits of metallics. Um, specifically around kind of the uh, the bottom half of the body and probably some final highlights on the upper half silver um, and then obviously knickknacks um, strange as it might be oh, yes the orcs knickknacks these painting um, I'm quite glad actually that I haven't gone down the streak and grime and rust streaks um, route I can't really if I'm honest be bothered using uh, enamels unless there's no other choice um, because as I say then I know I'm gonna need to use the uh, the old uh, uh, thinners, which I'd yeah always rather not. Um, so yeah, I think tomorrow that leaves a lot to do, but it's 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 doable. It's entirely doable. Um, the plan is to stream that as well. I know this has been quite a long stream, although actually it's not been as long as I thought. It's been like what an hour and eight minutes that feels like it's actually been longer than that but i don't think it has but quite a lot done in that hour and eight minutes leathers hair um skin obviously met metallics yeah i think that's solid 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 progress as they say um thank you for joining me whether you've joined for a little bit or for the whole time it's been a pleasure having you with me and nice to have a chat about some old styles of miniatures and uh, yeah i shall be streaming again tomorrow Catch you then.